Okay, so we just watched the film on the RV, uh, RVP uh, re-vapor pressure. And so what do you guys think? What did you learn from that video? What did you get out of it? I mean, was it important? Does it seem like that stuff is intelligent? The guy just blew it off? Doesn't know what he's talking about? Too intelligent for me. Well, I don't know that I want to store my gas six months anymore. <laughs> I think that... Go for it. I think I found it fascinating how with the pressure you can keep the RVP from coming out of the fuel, fuel from uh, evaporating and then that prevents the fuel pressure from going down which preserves the fuel. So I'm thinking that if there's a way at home I could take like a large metal fuel storage tank and then use nitrogen to pressurize it and preserve the gasoline for generators and that type of thing then use it for dispensing. Then it would make it possible to store like two or three hundred gallons of gasoline and have it not longer down. for a long term situation. For a -term so I, I mean to me the the thing that I got out of this the most is the fact that when you open that container when did he lose? He lost all the lighter fuels every time he opened up his 55 gallon thing. And here's a guy who's walking on the extreme edge of perfection. I mean, they're testing and dynoing racing engines. We want to be right on the edge between blowing something up and not blowing it up when we're talking about the racing world. So here's a person with computers, all the sensing apparatus to kind of test and monitor this engine right on the cutting edge. And they were able to determine, surely by accident, really when you first look at it, by accident they were able to figure out that as we start using our 55 gallon barrel, we had to like start adjusting our fuel volumes because the fuel went bad. So they were able to actually detect it just simply by doing their testing procedure. And the fact that they opened the container, took fuel out, and then sealed the container back up. That's a metal container. Every time they opened it up, they lost and the quality went down. You're at home. You've got a five gallon container of gasoline. It's the old style gas cans that are not sealed internally. They're the style that you set it out in the sun, it doesn't blow up and swell up. And you should know by this point that plastic containers breathe. And so the old plastic containers, when we went and we hit the evaporative emission standards in gasoline engines, they were regulating plastic gas tanks and fuel lines and carburetors because gas actually travels through the hose. It travels through the tank. It travels through the carburetor. And we were losing the lighter fuels in the gas world and just evaporated out. And we store stuff out in the sun all the time. So those objects are all vaporizing. So you get a five gallon red can that's the old style that doesn't swell up. That read vapor pressure, that lighter fuels, whew, gone. If you store your gas can in a warm area where it gets warm, which is the test he's doing, and it's warm, it's going to lose all the lighter fuels. If you went to a new style can that has the inner lining in it and you put it in the sun, what's it do? swells up and the can looks like it's going to blow up. Why? Because it's not letting those vapors travel through the plastic and come out. And so people are like, I can't stand those new tanks because they swell up, they're going to blow up. So I went and found me an old one. Well, the old one lets your gas go bad. And so not buying a new gas can that is truly sealed is really foolish. Especially here, you can kind of see how quickly you're going downhill. And what he demonstrated was the fact that as the lighter fuels disappeared, what do we do with the lighter fuels? What's the importance of the lighter fuels in my fuel? It keeps it fresh, it keeps it fresh but what does it do? What do the lighter fuels do for me in an engine that's running? They They're the ones that ignite first. They're the one that gets everything running. And so if I have just dead fuel, which he considers dead fuel, that's just thick, that's just the, the energy fuel, kind of really what it is. And I have no lighter fuels, a spark plug fires. Fuel has to be in what form to burn? Vapor. Vapor. Is that true in a diesel? 
Yes. So even in a diesel, it has to be in a vapor. If I cannot get it to vaporize, because weight vapor, that's the lighter fuels that vaporize that got the fire, it brought the temperature up to burn the heavier fuels. The heavier fuels are what give us the energy, but we need the lighter fuels to get it ignited at the right time to begin the process. And so we gotta have the lighter fuels. Or like you said, you know, in the winter, when I'm out there with a snowmobile, if the reed vapor pressure drops too low, I can't even get it started. The guy's out there pulling and pulling and pulling. Well, if I can't vaporize it, it's never going to fire. Stealth fuel has no vapor because all the lighter fuels are gone. Same thing's going to happen in a diesel engine. In a gasoline, I need lots of quick vapor to make it happen. In a diesel, we're gonna create heat of compression. It's a little bit easier to vaporize it when you've got a thousand degrees to throw the fuel into, rather than a gas engine that's throwing a single spark. So we have lower reed vapor pressure, but that still, that reed vapor pressure is gonna be critical in a diesel engine. It's way more critical in a gas engine. And what he's showing us here is when you heat the fuel up, so summertime applications, when you store your fuel outside, you store it in an open container, it's not a sealed container, we buy poor fuel. Even if I buy non-ethanol fuel and I don't seal it, what did I do? I still lost the world. So I only buy good fuel if I still have problems. Well, is it hot? Is it sealed? What do you got going? And so I look and think, it's, oh, man, I can't imagine what it's going to cost to buy the kit to actually put all the nitrogen in there. But instead of buying, you know, five five gallon containers that I use up over a two month period, that even though they're good containers, they're still going to go bad. I would be better off, like you said, getting a 55 gallon barrel go to town, try to get a good reputable dealer, get myself 55 gallons and seal it, go home. And I have basically preserved it, like I said, at the point that I bought it. Now I didn't buy it, well, I don't even know what I bought because you don't know what you bought. So, so whatever I got, that's it. I hold it there. And I pull my four wheeler up and I dispense into there. Buy good fuel from a reputable dealer, Make sure that you seal it right away and protect it. And it should be good a lot longer. Just put a drain at the bottom and use the pressure nitrogen to just... Well, there, yes, you could, but that tooling that he has, you put a hose and it shoots it out the top. So that tool that he has, you screw it in, you put nitrogen in one hole, the other hole has a tube hanging on it and it's, it's pulling it off the bottom. Like a hot water heater, yes. So it's pulling it off the bottom. It's the reverse of a hot water heater. Instead of putting the cold in the bottom, we're actually drawing the, the fuel off the bottom. And so we're actually using the pressure to shoot the fuel out the tube and into my machine. And then as soon as I shut the, the cock, then it's not gonna come out again. And I got nitrogen still pushing on the top, protecting it. Now I was wondering before I seen it, how he was gonna get the fuel. When he opened it, I thought, well, uh, the nitrogen is going to go away. Well, it's not going to go away because he didn't open the top. So he had that thing. So. Apparently, it doesn't from what we hear, for one. And two, nitrogen is in the air already. How much air is nitrogen? 73% 70 of the air is nitrogen. So it's already a normal product of of an engine so even if a little bit went in there it's not going to change much so apparently it doesn't absorb into the engine so storage we're talking about emissions so earlier we were talking about emissions coming out and byproducts of emissions poor combustion all the things the temperature the quality of the fuel all that stuff RVP is probably one of the most critical things that are out there that are affecting it. And how do we solve that problem? How do we get good fuel? How do we maintain good fuel? And having open containers, storage containers above ground that are in the sun, 
if you have a above ground storage, so somewhere we have a little chart shows a, you know, farmers used to have their tanks to sit above the ground. You get a brown tank that's open to the atmosphere, and one month you lose like 10, 15 gallons of gasoline. Well, what did I lose with the 10 or 15 gallons? The first month I lost all my light fuels. So really your fuel was still by the end of the first month if you didn't use it all up. If you were to put, just paint that tank white, it dropped it from 10 gallons, 15 gallons, down to like four gallons, simply painting it white. If you put a pressure vacuum gauge on it, so that the pressure had to build up to a certain point before it could relieve itself, or when, you, when it got cold at night, so sucking moisture in, which is just air, and then push the gases out in the daytime, putting a pressure vacuum thing on it dropped it down to like a half a gallon a month. That's how dramatic it was. If you put a roof on top with a white tank and pressure vacuum gauge, it was like you know, a quarter or something. It was just like almost nothing was lost. So there are ways of reducing it, but these tanks that you see that are sitting out by the guy's barn, it's like, whew, horrible situation. Just simply burying the tank would improve that, but then if I have a leak, EPA reasons you don't want to just bury a tank. So most of these new tanks that you see, like the college's tank, it's a vault, so it has multiple tanks. Two tanks with an inner liner, so if one fails, you can actually sense the thing leaked. And it gives you some kind of insulation factor, so it's not just sun beating on it. But even ours down there is not really very white. So if they would keep the paint on it bright white, you can buy snow cap for a roof on your house. It's called snow cap or some other names. It's 150% reflective. If you were to paint that on there, it's a rubber material so that it reflected the light back off, it would dramatically affect this. So many things that you can do to protect your fuel and make it better. Put a cover on it. Even though ours has got a vault like that, why is it not under a cover of some sort? So all those things are going to help. And we don't, we don't think about this enough when we start looking at problems that we're having with an engine. Where is it coming from? We buy good fuel. We got it stored in a container. Well, first of all, did we buy good fuel? Second of all, how long have we stored it? Is it sealed? So all those things. And, and what's neat in this video is he was able to actually measure it with the output of the engine. And when they measured the read value of the fuel before they started the test, they could make an adjustment to the engine and either richen it or lean it out to get maximum horsepower out of it. And they would also know, hey, our fuel's not very good. We're not going to achieve maximum horsepower. They were able to predict not being able to achieve it simply by having measured the read value before he even started the test. And that's an amazing thing that you can see with that. So this is some neat things that that video actually points out. Any other comments? Okay, so when you get the gas cans that expand after sitting for a while, and you go to hit the button... What's the first thing it does? What did you just lose? I just lost all the paper. Mm -hmm. So then if you keep doing that and you're not using it, but you keep on just releasing it so it squeezes back down to size, then isn't that... You did exactly what he did in the film, which was he cracked it, and it built up again. You're losing all your light fuels. You're better off leaving it Actually, just go move it to a cooler location because you notice he has to do it at 100 degrees. Storing your fuel in a cooler location is going to keep that vapor from building up because vapor is temperature related. So move it to a cooler location and then don't relieve the pressure. Don't go out there and relieve it because it looks like it's going to blow up. What's happening when the pressure builds up is it condensates and goes back into the fuel. So it stays in there. It can't come out. It can come out in any cracks or any failures in the so container. So to do it, you have the spout in your tank and then you push the button. No. <sighs> because it's vapored and it didn't have it in the air. Yeah. So I don't know if you shook the container if some of that stuff would actually get back in it or not. But if you when you relieve it, because you gotta relieve it, 
you lost whatever you lost. So if you were to take a container, relieve it, and then dump the whole container into your fuel tank, you're gonna get virtually everything. But if you're just using small amounts, a lot of times you're constantly relieving, dumping out half a gallon here, half a gallon here, half, so it's my lawnmower, I only use a quart, and I got a five gallon container, and shh, fill it up, and then shh, fill my little rotor tiller, shh, and then I go to my little four cycle string trimmer that has, you know, oil reservoir. Shh, if I have a bunch of little containers, every time I open it up, I'm losing and, and stuff's going to progressively run worse. That thing's running a lot worse than this one is. Well, which one did you feel first? Just to kind of explain what happened, we have an old truck and we have 25 five gallon gas cans. And they're the new style with the valve on top. And I was noticing last summer that the truck wasn't running as well with the fuel that we were using. It was close to two months old. And now that I understand this, I'm thinking back, because where the fuel cans sit, they all get bloated, just really big. And my brother has a habit of every time he sees them bloated, because they sit out in the sun, he walks down there and <laughs> leaves it off every time. So this happens at least once a week. This was probably going on for like two months. And what he's doing is he's getting rid of that, that vapor. And so by the time we put the fuel at the end of the summer, we're still dumping it in the truck. It's not uh, performing as well, which is why we're having so many problems with our truck. And it has some other challenges besides fuel. But, um, but it would have, if he keeps doing that, I and mean, why are you storing them in the sun? You know, I would have to have that conversation with some people. So put it in a shed. Right. Dig a hole in the ground, put a piece of plywood over it. I mean, right. there's a lot of things, simple things that you could do to keep them out of the sun and help prevent that problem. But if he's going in and relieving them, holy yeah. cow, he's just... Every time he goes, oh, well, they're all they're exploding. You've, you've eliminated the whole point of having that style of a container. Even that fancy container, if the pressure gets too high, it'll actually relieve itself. Right. So if it's really in the sun it'll relieve itself and you're going to lose even with a good container because we don't want the tank to blow up mm -hmm. and so those tanks are going to relieve themselves when they get to a certain point there's only so much spring pressure on that thing right. so don't ever store them in the sun people that store them in the back of their vehicles i mean it's just it's a bad idea so only take out what you need and you know don't just tie it onto the back so I buy about 25 gallons of fuel in the fall, non-ethanol, keep it in the shed, and in the spring while I fire my motor up with the 24 horse, it runs like crap, you know. First thing you think, well, I'm about to go rebuild the cupboard, it runs like crap. Well, after I've used all that fuel up and I go buy some new fuel, it runs better. Never thought about it. <laughs> 25 gallons is a lot of fuel to store over the winter. The second question would be when I buy it in the fall. So you buy it in the fall? Yeah. yeah. Okay, which, what point did I buy it in the fall? Did I buy it early fall? Because the fuel, even the gas fuel, we look at diesel, number one, number two. Gasoline changes over time because as we go into winter, they put more additives in there to bring up the reed vapor pressure to better run in the winter. So we don't typically think of gasoline as changing over the seasons, but it does. So if I buy it in September, I'm actually buying more of a summer blended gasoline. Mm -hmm. And if I go out there in the early spring when it's cold, or if I pull a snowblower out and use that same fuel, it's gonna run crappy because it's a heavy summer, low reed vapor pressure fuel. If I buy it in October, we're expecting freezing weather around here, most places. And so the gas tanks are already going into winter fuel. When I get to spring, and I try to run that over the summer, that light fuel is gonna burn really hot. And my engines are gonna run really hot and the energy is gonna be really low. If I buy a winter fuel store and run in the summer, it could damage my machine because it could burn too fast. So you can see the problem moves around. Diesel fuel is the same way. If I buy summer fuel and I try to use it in the winter, 
it's not going to burn well. If I buy winter fuel, come, let's say, February, I decide, hey, the price of fuel happens to be low, it's before spring break, I got a good deal, let's buy a bunch of diesel, and, and I'm going to burn it up until June or July. I'll use it by then, it won't go back, because George told me it lasts for six months. Well, if I bought it in February, there's a very good chance it's still number one diesel fuel, and by June, it hits 100 degrees, which it can, it's going to burn really fast and your engine's going to run hotter. So fuel is a, it's a hard thing to predict. It'd be cool if we had the testing instrument to be able to monitor what we have and to be able to adjust for it or do something for it. That's an awful lot of work though, to be paying attention to my fuel that closely. But this but, is also probably the reason why Fuel, electronic fuel injection engines do not have the fuel problems that carburetor engines have because in the fuel injection system, the vapor is trapped. It can't leave. In a carburetor, we have bull vents and things like this. So it's just sitting in there just vaporizing, right? Not really. We're still vaporizing. That's not the thing. Why is it different with a fuel injected? Because fuel injected is doing what? It's monitoring air pressure, engine temperature, uh, engine speed, and it was compensating for so that. it's common computers constantly looking at your engine and giving you the best performance with the fuel it's got well i'm thinking though in terms of storage uh, even in storage it's still going to take that crappy fuel and it's still going to atomize it better than a carburetor is going to because it's spraying out but it's also going to uh, monitor and, and adjust right to deal with the bad fuel hmm. okay so you look at these flex fuel cars. Flex fuel cars because we're monitoring all these parameters. The more parameters we measure, the more I can adjust to deal with, you know, non-ethanol fuel, and then I pull in here and I put E85 in. Uh, how do you do that? Well, it's a computer controlled system, and as the engine changes, it adjusts. Go back to our two cycle class. We have the steel carburetors that are half fuel and half computer controlled and you start them up and at 15 minutes it runs perfect. Well why? Because it's monitoring the, the stability of the engine and it's adjusting the fuel to get it to run as smooth as possible. And it takes 15 minutes of slow incremental changes to deal with stale fuel or super high octane fuel or high altitude or so it's adjusting fuel volume to get it to run as stable as possible. So we even have that in our handheld products, but it has to be a computer. The only way we can do it is to have a computer. And we, Joe Homeowner, doesn't even, once they get into the electronic world, they really forget about their fuel because the computer, it deals with their stupidity so well that they don't notice how how much the fuel storage that they're doing is hurting them. Because even though I'm computer controlled, I'm burning a lot more fuel, I'm burning less fuel, I'm still creating gum and varnish deposits even though it's running pretty decent. If it's running pretty crappy with an injection system, imagine if it was a carburetor. So how much damage is taking place? So those are just, there's so many things that you need to be aware of when it comes to fuel. and. I've never seen this test before. This was the first time with this video, and it really just is an eye-opener as to what they do and how, how fast, just how that changed the reed vapor pressure. That was kind of amazing. I didn't know that you could lose it that fast, because he's like, it went by half, it went by half, it went by half. You won't even hardly start a lawnmower. I'm thinking, whew. That's pretty amazing. <laughs> we make a lot of money off of these guys, you know, these boats who don't take care of them and don't know anything about this. Water, and the fuel, this everything else, you know. Well, some of them think that you're charging them for stuff that's not necessary either, but they don't realize it. <laughs> you take six carburetors off. And it's probably the, it's the most difficult thing because even when you try, because the service station doesn't provide a consistent fuel to you, no. even if you try, it is difficult to do. And we've had in the past, I've had a, a guy that I buy my oils through. I buy Schaefer Oil, my Schaefer Rep, 
And that's what he deals with, is diesel fuel and oils and that kind of stuff. And so he spends a lot of time and a lot of testing. And so he comes and every time he comes with me, it's almost depressing. Because he comes with all these tests that he's like, you don't realize how bad the fuel is. And we told you the story a ways back where I have a thousand gallons of bad fuel. And I trade it back into the company because that's all I can do. I trade it into the gas company. The gas company pours it into a big tank, mixes it up, and sells it back to you in a service station. And so those cheapo, you know, low price places you buy gas, that's what they're getting is that stale fuel that's been sitting around and they couldn't sell it somewhere and they brought it back. Another one he told me, which is interesting, we have all this military equipment that went off to war. Well, before it ships to, to across the ocean, it cannot have any fuel in it. And if they're going to bring it back, they got to take it. So they drain every bit of fuel out of every machine. And he said they didn't have like one tank for premium, one tank for diesel. He said they poured fuel in one container. And then they had this gigantic, you know, I don't know, it was like a 20, 30,000 gallon thing that all the fuel, jet fuel, diesel fuel, gasoline, whatever, it all went into the same gigantic huge storage container. And then when they got done with all the stuff that they were doing, then they sold that and they just bid it out to the lowest bidder, or highest bidder, I guess it was, not the lowest. Yeah. Highest bidder, somebody bought that, mixed it into fuel, and sent it out to you, Joe Public. So it, it was stuff that, you know, you have all these guard shops around the state. Well, they have equipment sitting in their lot. And all of a sudden, they got called up for guard duty. You go get everything that's in your yard, how long has it been sitting there? Where did they get the fuel from? Did they store it on their site? Did they get it from a gas station? I mean, whew. then they like load it all up and they haul it over to Bemington or wherever we're gonna load it up over there. And before we put it on the ship, we're gonna drain all that fuel out. So you can imagine just, I mean, holy cow, you start thinking about how old some of that stuff could be. And then we put it all in the same gigantic tank and then it's been in the tank for how long? Because it was in there for quite a long time before they got this big volume. And then somebody bought it, mixed it with other fuel, and sold it to you. You wonder why your car doesn't work well. You wonder why your car doesn't work well. So when I say buy from a reputable dealer, I don't even know how to predict who is a reputable dealer. I mean, I, I, when I look out there, if I'm going to guess, I'm going to say Chevron is probably going to be my reputable dealer because they're a big guy that's, you know, they got their distilleries and you're paying more because you're buying fresher fuel. Texaco and Chevron are the same company, so you might be getting kind of similar fuels from that location. Uh, Shell or Exxon, I don't know what this is. And I'm, I'm not sure about Cenex because I don't know that Cenex has their own distillery. So is Cenex buying from them? I mean, I don't know that little chain of, of command that's coming from there. So, you know, it, those, those gas stations, you pay a little bit more, but I think you're really probably buying, I mean, hopefully, I'm assuming that I'm buying better quality fuel. I don't have a tester that I can pull out and test it. There is no governing body that goes in and tests it. There is nothing out there that gives you adequate information that says it was fine. When I go and I buy from, what's one of these low price places, Taj or, uh, I think Conco is maybe a little bit higher level. They're a bigger per. There's some, you know, gas stations like a um, um, single owner type situation where they have a convenience store. Those those places are ones that just bid out. We need some fuel. Who's the cheapest? We'll buy it. Yes, I've heard a while back that Taj, like the one here in town, <coughs> from what I've heard, that some the area often they might add water or something. And it may be the water came from the fuel, wherever it came from. So, do they physically dump water in it? Probably not. But, you know, if they have old tanks, they're not cleaning them, you don't know what you're getting. So, 
in the town where I come from, <coughs> you buy gas there, you will have water. But just again. And it just, I mean, there's just so many factors that can change that stuff. So it's tough. If you are having bad experience with the fuel that you're getting, your equipment's not running very well, you might try a different place to get your fuel from and see, hey, I had a different experience. But it's very difficult to even notice the difference because most of our equipment's not running peak. And I'm out there mowing my lawn with my John Deere lawnmower. That's going to be hard to know. Is that you know today this thing is really running nice, and the next day this is really not running. I mean, it's hard to tell. You could do it in a car because you're monitoring fuel mileage. Where Ethan had that experience, where he's like, I changed fuel and my fuel mileage went up by this amount. I got sixty some gallons, sixty some miles further on a tank of gas with this company than I did this company. That's a measurable thing. So it's hard for most of us to know that any other way. But things that we can do, how do we store our fuel? Would it be cost effective to buy that kit? And I'm curious to know what that kit's going to cost and I haven't even looked into it. So I want to go back to the two websites he listed and see what it would it cost for me to get that little kit and now buy fuel in a metal 55 gallon barrel rather than smaller containers because that's what I do. I try to only buy enough non-ethanol fuel to get me through maybe two months tops and that's it and then only we run a towel at times so I try maybe go to two months. I've got some pretty nice sealed containers. Two of them, the cap is you know, a fancy thing and the little stupid spring thing broke on it and it costs as much to buy the new little spout as it does to buy the whole jug. So what I do is I use I come home, I'm usually out of fuel and a bunch of stuff, and I take those two containers and I immediately fill up everything that I have empty and drain them as fast as possible so that my sealed ones I store in a room, a storage room that's out of the sun. And so that's the best thing I can do right now. This would be kind of cool. My problem with putting in a 55 gallon barrel is how do I dispense it? Well, this would come with its own dispenser unit. So. With a five gallon can, um, if before you use it, if it's pressurized, you shake it, try and get those vapors on the side of the can back in the fuel, and then turn the can up before you open the nozzle so that the fuel is the only part out and then the vapor in the airspace up above. Well, I don't know. Air's coming up through. I don't know about how all that works. So, so anyway, that was an interesting video and it kind of came from that slide. So it was a great uh, thing to think about. So still in emissions because that was all about emissions. Other types of emissions are excites of nitrogen. So in our world, nitrogen in the diesel world is one of the problems that we have. So uh, nitrogen is a colorless, odorless, tasteless gas that quickly converts to in a, uh, nitrous oxide in the presence of oxygen. Diesel engines have the cap uh, capability to produce far more nitrous oxide than gas because we have an excess amount of oxygen in our cylinder. So we have a readily amount which it needs, it needs oxygen to combine to, to, to form that and it needs extremely high pressures. And the pre-mechanical or the pre-electronic systems, we would get that knock, that big, sharp, rapid pressure temperature rise. We'd have the temperature and we have the oxygen. We have a lot of nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide is what we see as smog. So later we'll see that, but it's, it's gonna form smog in our big cities. So getting rid of nitrous oxide, is a way of reducing smog and it is one of the heavily regulated pieces in the tier 4 emission standards. So what causes odor? So that smell that we smell in our diesel engine? I kind of looked up what aromatic molecules trying to get a better idea of what they are and man you go to Wikipedia and there's like pages and it's just complicated. So there are complex hydrocarbons called aromatic molecules. They're difficult to burn at low temperatures and pressures. So it's a molecule, a chain of hydrocarbons, and we'll see it in the next slide how that's linked together. But the way that they form that chain 
it has a lot of energy in it, but it's very difficult to burn because it doesn't break apart very well. And we need to break the molecule apart so that oxygen can attach to it and burn and release the energy. So these molecules are what really are the thicker stuff. When we lose our reed vapor off the top, the lighter fuels, we're left with these items, these molecules. They're stable, they don't evaporate very well, but they don't burn well either. So we need something to get them burning. And once they get hot enough and stuff, they'll burn and go away and actually help us. So if you have damaged, missing, or cold catalytic converters that are what burn that excess carbon off, if we don't have those, then we're going to have a lot more odor. So we'll, we'll tend to smell it more with people that take all those out. So here's a picture of them. Here's my conventional hydrocarbon chain. They're all nice and perfect. And aromatic hydrocarbon is more like this. That bond, it's really difficult to break it apart. This chain here is so long, you can snap them pretty easy. This one doesn't break up. So because it doesn't break up, it takes more temperature, more pressure to actually break it up to make it work. So. This is getting into evaporative emissions. So we're talking about how you pour gas on a floor, it's gone, pour diesel on the floor, it takes forever. And so you look at here, two day measurement of evaporative emissions and gasoline, you know, lots and lots. I mean, it doesn't, people spill gas and it's gone all the time. <clears throat> Whereas diesel is actually pretty low. It takes a lot more temperature and, and it has, uh, the temperature needs to be higher to get diesel to actually vaporize. So we're going to stop it again and we're going to go watch this video. This is a little bit different, but this one, the guy is actually going to pour fuel out on the ground and light it so we can actually visibly see how easy gas lights. And then the guy actually puts gasoline in a diesel car and he puts diesel in a gas car and he goes to see what he can do. And he, so he goes, buys four junker cars and he does this experiment and it's kind of comical. So in some ways it's going to be kind of funny, but it's also kind of looking at what happens when a person does it. How does it affect a vehicle if you were to put the wrong fuel in the wrong car? But isn't that pretty much why they put, like when you go to dispense diesel and or gas at the nozzles and the openings for the... So we're going to see that in the film. So we're going to stop the film.